Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. Here is a quick look at the EKG. You can start to think about it before I give you the case. See what you think. And then we start with a 35 year old male who is in his basement in his house where he has a gym, very athletic guy, but he's saying he's having a really hard time breathing because he just took a pre-workout drink, one of those energy drinks before he started, and now he feels very short of breath and he feels like his heart is racing. You get his vital signs, and before you get him on the monitor, this is what you see. You have a heart rate of 147. His pressure is a little bit soft at 97 over 56, but his O2 sat is okay at 96. Blood sugar looks good. Intidal is also a little bit low. This should catch your eye. Um, but other than that, he's talking to you. He looks okay. He's just breathing fast and looks like he's uncomfortable. When you get his 12 lead, this is what you see. And the computer actually disagrees with the pulse ox here and gives you a rate of 267. Now let's see if we can confirm that or not. Let's find a QRS that lines up on one of the thick red lines here. And the next one is 300, and this is just less than 300, so I would concur. This is an incredibly fast heart rate at 267. The next question we asked ourselves is the rhythm. Is it regular and is there a P wave before every QRS? Well, it looks very regular to me. I would call this mono monomorphic. The shapes are generally the same. It looks like it's marching out pretty much at the same rate every time. Um, but it's hard to tell because it's so fast, so we don't know for sure. Then the question about the P waves. My goodness, this does not look normal, does it? Actually, it looks a little bit scary. Um, and as I try to find P waves, I think I see them just kind of buried throughout um, these QRS complexes here, and sometimes those could be called retrograde P waves. There's P waves that are trying to get through, but the ventricles have taken over in such a fashion that they're dominating the rhythm here, and it's really hard to find P waves that are getting through. One thing of note here uh, that'll help us with our diagnosis is I think I see two beats right here that actually look kind of normal. These would be capture beats. There's a P wave QRS, P wave QRS, and then it goes back into this very wide, very fast rhythm. But this here is suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. Um, so a good thing to note there with those P waves and those complexes. Um, again, this is a difficult rhythm, so it doesn't follow the textbook, but it's good to go through it stepwise anyways. So our axis, another difficult thing to do because there's no real discernible baseline. Um, I would probably call this line kind of about the baseline here. And then to determine our axis, we look at one and AVF. Again, our baseline here, since we have these normal QRS complexes, we'll call that the baseline. So in lead one, let's say we're mostly down, right? So our left thumb is down. Our right thumb is up, which leads us with a right axis deviation. I would concur with the computer there if we've defined our baseline correctly. Little less important because our biggest problem right now is our QRS is very, very wide. Um, if you look here, you can tell just by looking at it, it's much wider than normal. Um, and here it's, um, we want it to be less than 120, it's 230, way too wide. And when that happens, our QT is going to just naturally get prolonged as well. So our QT is very long, our QRS is wide, we have a very fast tachycardia. It's almost impossible to discern ST segments here, I just labeled them as difficult. So what we're left with is a very wide, very fast tachycardia that I would just call VTAC. And this is one that you can just burn into your brain. Um, wide, fast tachycardia, VTAC. Um, we have a wide complex here as we put it together with right axis deviation a little less important here with a rate of 267. This is something we need to be prepared to fix very quickly because this is one of our lethal, potentially lethal arrhythmias. Now with this guy, he's awake, he's talking, he seems to be perfusing okay. Although his end title was 20, so it suggests that there's something metabolically going on where he's not getting all the oxygen delivery he needs. But the question, once you recognize VTAC, once you have that one burned in your brain, you want to ask yourself, is this stable or unstable? 
Right now, I would define this guy as stable. He has a blood pressure, he's talking, he's mentating well. Um, but I always, in the back of my mind, would be concerned that this could become unstable at any minute. So this is a guy, even though he's awake and talking, I would still put the pads on. I would still be ready to defibrillate. But right now, since he seems to be doing okay, what I'm going to try is an antiarrhythmic. In our guidelines here for our EMS system, we have lidocaine. Um, some other systems may recommend amiodarone. Um, you want to try to get that ventricular dysrhythmia under control with medication first. And if he becomes more unstable, then you need to move to cardioversion. And so you have those pads in place. If his blood pressure drops low, uh, if his mentation starts to decrease, if he starts to look worse, that's when you're going to need to cardiovert. And you start with 100, 200, 360 as you need to to get that rhythm back in sync where it should be and reestablish a pulse and reestablish good perfusion for his tissues. Um, so those are your two options. You can either do an antiarrhythmic, and in this case I would probably give some fluids too, or if he's unstable you could do your defibrillation. And that is all for today. Thank you for joining me for Stable VTAC, and I'll see you next week.